us in the ministry love these kind of books, the Timothys and, the, and Titus. Uh, they're known as uh, pastoral epistles, mainly because uh, Paul was, uh, they're both written, they're all three written to, to young preachers from the great apostle Paul. So a lot of good advice there, a lot of good things to talk about. Uh, we're in a, uh, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. We, uh, I'm excited, I'm very excited about the years to come. Um, the, the fact that our church has stepped out by faith and has committed before the Lord to pay down the property that we own money on in just four or five years. That's amazing. That's amazing. And then I'm thinking about steps of faith. I look at our missions board over here. Clearly, we're, we're making our missions commitment month by month. By the way, that takes faith. Amen. It really does. It takes, takes faith because we give by purely faith promise, giving above and beyond our tithe and offering. Praise God for that, by the way. That's, that's a Bible way to do it. I love doing things the Bible way. Looking at that, we uh, our church chose to step out at the same time we committed to paying down our property by faith. By the way, all it takes is each given family $20 a week. Is that awesome? Amen. Hey, Amen. I, I started to say I've got 20. I ran out of 20. The day I committed to that, 20 quit being easy to come up with. <laughs> <laughs> and Morgan said, yeah, it will take faith. So uh, uh, we say, well, by faith, if you don't have 20, give as much as you can up to that. Let that be between you and the Lord. And if you have more than 20 that you can give, we'll take up to, take up to a thousand or so. Just anything you want to give week by week. Wouldn't it be good to give a thousand week by week? Praise God. Amen. By faith. <laughs> so uh, trust God for it. That's what we're saying. And we don't want to know what you're giving. The way you make that known is just by the end of February, uh, be, have, make a choice before the Lord and, and be doing it. Uh, on, your, on your tithe and offering envelope, there's a place that says special over there. Just write mortgage on it and give to that. Now, I'm telling you that because we're doing these things by faith. That's exciting. Uh, the two missionaries, we knew of one that we just felt compelled to take on. And another one, we, we're asking the Lord to lead us to him. And uh, we're going to get this guy in here. If it's not the one we're aiming at, I don't know. We'll just wait and see what God leads us to with that. By faith... Take on two new missionaries at the rate that we support the others. Amen. Hey, listen. God blesses a church that steps out by faith. When, when a church steps out by faith, God will extend His grace. If, if I'm going to, to experience grace... If I'm understanding the Bible right, my access to it is through faith. It's, it's that grace cometh by faith. Right? Yeah. Faith comes by. Faith is what leads us to grace. The grace of God. As a matter of fact, when you have the confidence to pray and ask God to bless, ask God to move. You have a lost loved one that needs to be saved and, and you, you just don't know what else to say and what else to do. And, and finally, you get to the business of doing what we should have been doing from the beginning and going into the prayer closet, crying out to God. Hey, one beggar begging for bread for another beggar. Amen. Hey, praying and asking God to save somebody. When He does, that's an extension of His grace. When you're struggling to pay the bills, I'm talking about the faithful one, the one who lives to serve God. And they're faithful to the house of God. They're walking with God, doing what God says do. And they walk out under the stars one night and hold up their checkbook before the Lord and tell Him, what do I do? I'm only here because you call me here. What am I going to do? You must intervene. And He does. Amen. By faith, hey, we reach Him. And He reaches down and He acts in love and mercy. And He takes a step on our behalf when He 
you call that? Grace. Access to grace. The Bible says we read the other night, Hebrews chapter 4, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because he who sits upon the throne, when he hears, by the way, when he listens to my prayer, that's an effort of mercy on his behalf. What need does he have of my prayer? Ooh, hey, he's a merciful God. It's also a step of grace. God listens to the begging person who's crying out to God, that same guy who's just trying to make ends meet, just trying to do what God said to do. But he hears the cry of the lost sinner too. Why? Because he's a merciful God. He's full of grace. He wants to extend grace. Access to the throne of grace. We were talking about it the other night in Hebrews 4. The actual context there is when we, we're, we're, you remember the, the laboring in the Word of God because it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Labor in it. Crying out to God. Hey, before Him we're naked. He sees us all. He knows the need. We have not a great high priest who is not, not touched by the feeling of our infirmities. It says that. He's moved on my behalf. I haven't even prayed yet on that passage. Then he says, therefore, come boldly before the throne of grace. Get mercy. Need mercy. Who are we, this arrogant crowd that lives today? What we really need is mercy from an almighty God. And grace, it says. Mercy. Grace. God has mercy. In response to His own mercy, He extends Grace. And then it says, and help in a time of need. You, you can cry out to God. He will hear you because He loves you. He has mercy for you. He'll extend grace to help you in your time of need. Title of today's message, I have to put titles on them now. We're YouTube in these days. Isn't that exciting? We can put it out there and people can see it and hear it. Today I want to preach to you on this subject. Grace, grace. God's grace. Amen. He's a good God, isn't he? Amen. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He chose to come and lay down his life. For me. Amen. Whew, had no desserts in that. That's my mama used to say. No desserts there. I didn't deserve that. That's what she's saying. Hey, that's grace. God's extending grace. Hey, when Jesus was sent by the Father, the Father was having mercy and He was extending grace to this world. He sent His Son to die on the cross. Jesus Christ, the lover of my soul. Verse number 11 says this. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Grace comes in all forms. Many forms, I should say. Grace comes in all types. Or I should say many types. I shouldn't say all. I'm not sure how inclusive or how wide it really is. And what I really know about grace, it is such a huge subject. It seems so hard. To this is a subject I have always struggled to preach about. Because the problem we face with grace is that we oversimplify it. Grace is something that's big. Hey, the grace of God 
Think about that. It's the reason we're here together today. The grace of God. Uh, we, can, we talk about, well, grace is the unmerited favor of God. Well, it truly is the unmerited favor of God. But that little phrase doesn't do it justice. Think on this thing. From before the foundation of the world, He was considering my eternal well-being. God was concerned for me before I was even in existence. He created Adam. From the creation, from the from the world itself, from the dust of the ground, which apparently he created from nothing. Or was that the cosmic gases that exploded? Amoeba. How did that work? Is that ludicrous or what? I feel safer with the grace of God than I do some scientist theory. Beloved. I know who God is. I trust Him. I walk with Him day by day. I talk with Him. I talked with Him this morning. I talked with Him about many of you this very day. What did you say, preacher? <laughs> and an honest note, I cried out for God's grace for many of the people in this room this morning before daylight even came. Because, not because I have the ability to love people that way, but because by the grace of God, God can love you through me. Amen. I love you, but it's born in the mercy and grace of an almighty God. He's a good God. He's a good God. Wow. You ever thought about that? When's the last time? When's the last time you were struggling? I'm not even talking finances. Hey, your loved one might pass away any time. Or maybe it's you. A great sickness or an illness. Or maybe it's a lost loved one who needs to be saved. And you're afraid that they might pass on into eternity. When's the last time you simply cried out to God and He prevailed? He can do that. It's by the grace of God we have the option to come to a throne of grace. And it's by the grace of God that He answers our prayers. He's a good God. A good God. The word grace could not even be applied to any other. Only God can have God's kind of grace. Only He could bestow upon us the great love that comes from Himself. Grace can move in many directions. He can, he can extend grace to me through you and vice versa. All of that's good. The passage here speaks of a specific direction or kind of grace. It describes it for us. It says, for the grace of God, what kind of grace is it? The grace of God that bringeth salvation. Anything, anything God does on my behalf is an act of grace. Yeah? Are you following that? <coughs> Anything God does in response to my prayer, when He extends it on my behalf, is an act of grace. But here it's referring to that specific time. Hey, it says, the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Do you remember that one? Do you remember the grace of God that brought you to Jesus? Amen. Hey, He convicted my heart. Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I know all of that now. At the time I didn't, I just knew I felt guilty for the wicked things I was doing. I couldn't figure it out. I didn't understand it. I've been doing some of those things for a while. But then all of a sudden, I couldn't live with myself. I couldn't understand why I was not, I was not restful, why I didn't enjoy it the way I used to. I would be standing in a 
den of iniquity, some devil's hole somewhere, thinking about the things of God. That's not natural. Hey, that's an extension of the grace of God. Hey, God sent the Spirit to convict my never dying soul. You believe that? God loves you. Enough to send Jesus to the cross. Jesus loves you enough to choose to go to the cross. The Holy Spirit loves you enough to pursue you and rescue you and bring you to Himself. It says this. There are a couple of things that it says in this passage. Uh, the Bible says in this passage concerning the grace of God that bringeth salvation. The grace of God that moves in the direction of salvation. A couple of things. One thing it says, it hath appeared to all men. You think about it, that says a lot. You ever thought about that? It appears, it appeared to all men. Well, there are a couple of things, and, and uh, Lord willing, uh, the next one, the teaching part, we'll talk about tonight. I want to talk to you this morning most more specifically on the salvation, uh, the grace that brings salvation this morning, it hath appeared to all men. There's something you need to know. Beloved, the grace of God, first of all, is available to everyone. Amen. It's available to everybody. There is no one that's chosen to be left out. Did you get that? Amen. That's right. God chose uh, everybody to receive of the grace of God. It's not the will of God that any should perish. God chose to extend His grace to everyone. The Bible says it appeared to all men. I was reading commentaries about this. They debated about what does exactly the Bible mean by all men. Does it mean all people groups? And if you're in that people group, it could have come to you. It's ludicrous some of the things they say. The Bible doesn't say any of that. It just says the grace of God appeared to all men. That's good news. It's good news. You know why? Because that means everybody has a chance to partake of the grace of God that, that gives us salvation. Preacher. What about the jungle? Where the gospel's never been. There's something you need to know. God put the gospel in our hands. He didn't trust us to find all men. God takes care of that himself. When, when somebody responds to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, you ever have a missionary, somebody, God's called me Guam. Little island out there. He's probably never, if he does get a group together, it probably won't grow more than 12 or 15. There just aren't any people there. But there's, hey listen, there's somebody there that God is getting the gospel to. Why, some guy, several years ago, uh, probably 10 years ago, some guy, God moved in his heart to rise up and go to school and learn how to preach and teach learn the Bible and take it to this little speck of an island. Avoid the military bases and go to the people. And the flesh doesn't need you to do that. The flesh doesn't need you to do that. If you were to talk to Paul the clerk right now, he'll tell you, he'll tell you, I know God has called me to this place, to this people. Why would he be there? I'll show you. Open your, take your Bibles and turn it to John chapter 16 real quickly.
the same reason. Hey, though somebody in Guam, I guarantee you, is going through the same thing I was going through back in 19 years ago. <laughs> in Clovis, New Mexico, in some devil's home, like I said, I can remember this just like it was yesterday. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how many times have I shared this? Never gets old. Hey, listen, beloved. God loves everybody the way He loves you and me. Did you know that? God didn't single us out because we're in America in the 21st century or the 20th century for some of us. God didn't single us out because He thinks we're good at what we do and, and, and more people there are likely to get saved than anywhere else. God brought the gospel here because somebody needed to get saved. God's in the business of convicting people and He's doing it all around this world. Amen? Hey, you find that deepest, darkest jungle somewhere. David Livingston, in one of his reports, was it in the 1700s or 18, early 18 or late 1700s, he carved the path up through Africa. National Geographic paid for it. You can believe that now. National Geographic paid for this thing, but he went as a missionary of God. He told them, you have to understand, I'm going for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll take pictures if you want me to. They said, we'll pay for it. They did Carved the path up through there. He gets way up into the jungles of Africa. And he comes across a village <coughs> that has a church. They're saved. Don't look right, but don't look the way ours does. And, and by the time he finishes his report, all he can figure is that something that happened from the eunuch going back down to Ethiopia, and then the gospel must have spread and on into the continent. What I'm telling you is there's no such thing as a place that's out of the reach of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. These people, they're going to colonize Mars. You hear that group? The dumbest group. These are the same ones that believe in the amoeba slamming up onto the shore. They're going to colonize Mars. You do manage to get to Mars. You won't get far enough to escape the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God. Run all the way to another planet if you want to. He will be there waiting on you. Do what you will. God is bigger than all of this. John 16. Jesus is the night before the crucifixion. He's telling His disciples how things are going to be. He wants them to be ready for when the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. Jesus is an advocate of theirs, comforter, advocate, same word. He wants them to be ready for the new kind of advocate that's coming, the new kind of comforter that's coming. He says in verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I'll tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. What's happening must happen. He says, For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And now He's here, beloved. He says, when He has come, He will, excuse me, He will, what's the next word? Reprove. Reprove. Have you ever looked that word up in the dictionary? And say something like this, to convict or to convince. Those three words are synonymous. They mean the same thing. When you talk about reproving someone, you're talking about convicting or convincing them of something else. He says, so you could, that word works interchangeably with conviction. He says, He will reprove or convict or convince the world of three things. Of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Let me ask you, when he says the Holy Spirit will reprove the world, how many people does that include? Everybody. That's everybody, is it not? <clears throat> so the Holy Spirit of God shows up in everybody's heart of sin because they believe not on me. 
of sin because if hey, they need the righteousness of Christ. You get that by having faith in Christ. Belief leads to faith. They don't believe in Christ, so they are in sin. Yes? Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So now Jesus Himself will not be able to walk this earth and demonstrate righteousness before mankind. Something better is here though. The Holy Spirit of God can prick the heart of man and cause them to see their need for righteousness. Amen. It's true. That's why I don't believe there really is such a thing as an atheist. Every time I meet someone that says they're an atheist at the door, before they're done, they're telling you why they hate God. It isn't that they don't believe in God. They don't like what He's telling us. The last thing it says that everybody has revealed, has revealed to them of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Hey, listen to what I'm saying. The one whispering in their ear that they can have power with Him. They can have prestige with Him. They can have worldly fame. They can have finances. They can have all the money they need. They can build an empire on this earth. But the one whispering in their ear will too stand judgment. You can't escape consequences of sin. You can't escape judgment because there is no power large enough to escape the consequences of sin before an almighty God. Amen. Satan himself will stand before God one day. Amen. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Everybody gets that message. Why is it that we get up? Some missionary, it's on his heart and mind. He must go. I talked to God last night. Oh, I'm trying to just get to, if we can get, have fellowship together or something. He's in Kissimmee. He said, Preacher, God called me. He's been there like five years. They have like three or four people. They've got them a place to meet. He said they run about 30 every week, but it's always tourists coming to Disney, and they'll come there and have church with them, and they go out to do the rides. He said they just can't reach people from the community. He's having to work so many hours uh, to pay the bills. He's not able to get something going. I said, I said, are you 100% sure that you are where God wants you to be? He said, preacher, God called me. I have to be here. And you suppose there's somebody down there in Kissimmee whom the Holy Spirit of God has convicted and they have responded with the idea of repentance. And they want to know more. And so God's raised up a man for just such an hour as this. He told me about a husband and wife that came. Oh, they, they loved the church, got excited on a Wednesday night. Remember if they got saved or if they were already saved. So excited. I know they haven't been in church. So excited because they finally found a family that was excited. Thursday he learned the woman was diagnosed with cancer on Thursday. Friday she passed away. That quickly. He said, Preacher, it was discouraging. <laughs> He said, but I believe she was saved. Amen. For just such a time as this, why would a man go? Hey, listen. Why would the Holy Spirit call anybody to do anything? Hey, think this one through. It's about people. It's about people. people. Say, the Holy Spirit of God convinced somebody. There's no gospel witness there. I believe this with all my heart. There are folks out there being convicted of sin and they're responding with repentance and God raises up a man. Have you ever, you ever heard, well as a matter of fact, there was a specific story, I think down in Micronesia, but a specific story where, where this elderly lady, she was around 60 or 65, she said it just, it just became clear to her, maybe it was through a gospel track or a Bible, something she found became clear to her that she needed something she did not have. And all she said, she would pray, if there's a God up there, I want help. One day a man came, six or seven years later, 
a missionary came. Now they lined up the dates. They're even confident it was the very same day. This man was like a plumber, some, some job he had. He said he was doing his job. He said, and God broke his heart in the moment. In the moment, he's doing his job and he surrendered to the mission field while he was doing his job. Went to his preacher and asked him what to do. They sent him to Bible college for four years and after all of that was accomplished, spent a year and a half raising his... It's been a couple of years. Raised, raised his support in a year and a half and he said he was on the field and when, she, when he got there, she had already... Well, she had heard the gospel and she was ready. She got saved that day, provided with a place to meet and they reached the whole community very quickly. What a story. I wish you could remember. I'm sure it was in Micronesia. God loves everybody. Hey, this is the kind of grace that brings salvation. It's the grace of God. Let me ask you, is there somebody that you know that needs that kind of grace? I want to point something out to you. The way the conviction of the Holy Spirit works. If you know somebody that needs to be saved, I think we pray about it all wrong sometimes. Why not pray? Because they're being convicted. They've heard of this. Why not pray that they would respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God with repentance. <clears throat> that they would, their heart would be broken and they would know they need to be saved. God's grace reaches everybody. That person responds to God. His call for salvation. They want to be saved. Believe me, beloved. God will get the gospel to them. God will get the gospel to them. Hey, listen. Do you believe God's big enough to do that? You think He's big enough to do that? Hey, this is God's plan. You think He's big enough to follow through? It says, But speak thou the things which... I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong verse. Verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation, it says, It hath appeared to all men. It has appeared to everyone. Everyone. Hey, the fact that God is convicting us of sin, that's not punishment. That's the mercy of God that produces that. When a person needs to get saved and God makes them aware of it and understanding their need, He convicts their heart. Beloved, it's a move of grace. He's trying to save their never dying soul. God don't force that on anyone. He doesn't. Here's the thing. It appears to everyone. But do you know what it means if, he, if it appears to everyone? The last part of those three points that the Holy Spirit brings out. Judgment. The grace of God appears to everyone. And everyone is accountable for what they have seen. You get that? Oh. Does that make you want to pray for the loved ones that you know? Think about that. The grace of God has appeared to them all. And to you this morning. And listen. Jesus took the penalty of our sin on the cross. Literally, He carried our sin with Him to the cross. Not just a guiltiness, but the Bible says He became sin for us. He became sin for us. Jesus died on the cross with our sin. That's what the Bible says are the wages of sin. Sin, is, sin brings death. But Jesus, in an act of unmeasurable grace, died in our place carrying our sin. Three days later, continued action of grace. He rose from the dead. Gives him power over the grave. According to the Bible, he has power over death. 
He can take us to heaven with Him. It takes believing and having faith. Before you can get to that place, sharing with a young man yesterday, before you can get to the place of accepting that wonderful gift of eternal life, a person has to be willing, a person has to repent of sin. It only comes on the other end of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Sadly, we live in a day where it's very popular to resist the Holy Spirit. And resist, and resist, and resist. Be careful with that. For when you resist too long, it could be that He, he gets weary of striving with you. The Holy Spirit of God convicts. The best response is repentance. 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 You know anybody that refuses to repent? According to this, it has appeared to all of them. It's appeared to everybody. We're accountable for what we know. Everyone is accountable for what they know. I'll close with just a short verse, a little passage in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, if you will. Everyone's accountable, beloved. The great mercy of everlasting life, or the great extension of grace of everlasting life, is mentioned in verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The purpose of the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God is to give salvation to everyone. Amen. But then it says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. There is accountability for the grace that has made its appearance in everyone's life. There's accountability. It says, Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. And that is what it comes down to, isn't it? When a person cannot get saved. It really isn't about God preventing them. God has offered them light. They're accountable for that. But some people just love darkness more than they love light. Some people just love sin more than they love righteousness. Some love bondage more than they love liberty. We were talking about that in our PTSD meeting the other night. Some just... just feel more comfortable in the walls of bondage because it's familiar territory than they do being set free with the liberty that comes in Christ. <coughs> liberty is from sin and death and hell. It is available this morning. Let me ask you this. Let's get musicians to come home.